Um, Renee, could you please briefly expand on your personal background that led you to working in the field of regenerative agriculture with a focus on soil health? Um, my background, as you mentioned, I studied agricultural economics. Um, I worked with US government um, at the embassy in Beijing as an agricultural specialist. Um, I don't know why I always point like Beijing is that direction. Um, and uh, uh, then I was uh, hired by John Deere in China. So I worked uh, for John Deere in the private sector. Um, and it was there that I started my interest in sustainability. At that time, John Deere was acquiring several um, uh, irrigation systems companies. And I thought, okay, now we're getting somewhere. Um, the agricultural equipment group is gonna be focusing on irrigation and maybe now we can start connecting more of the dots on the farm. Um, was with them for 10 years and between when I started and when I left, they had sold off all the irrigation businesses. So that was a bit of a disappointment. Um, and I wanted to move the needle within John Deere around regenerative farming systems. So really thinking, how could we develop equipment for a different type of farming system? Um, but there wasn't much appetite within John Deere at the time to do that. Uh, I think there's a lot of interesting things happening now there that I don't know about, but uh, at that time there wasn't much interest. So I left. Um, and that's when I got really focused around working with startups to see how we could leverage new technologies and innovation to help scale this regenerative vision that we have. Um, and then also I started working with investors on due diligence. So um, there's a lot of new interest from the investor community in this space, which is very exciting, uh, but um, uh, it is a unique, it's not the same as just a software business. So there's some unique elements. And so that was part of what I did was uh, working with them and kind of learning about their interests. Um, and then um, I really kind of, you know, through that time as an independent, recognize that this is in fact where I want to put my energy and passion um, is to scaling regenerative uh, agriculture and very specifically uh, building soil health globally. Um, and so I took a role with the Nature Conservancy, which is where I am now as the Director of Agriculture Innovation. Um, I also sit on two boards of companies that are also very important for uh, moving the needle here. One is on the, well, one is not, I was going to say on the post-harvest side, but not always. They do aeromedically sealed bags for um, grain storage, grain and other commodity storage. And then also um, uh, they can also be used for seeds, which is important for protecting seed and also for protecting post-harvest losses um, and uh, min minimizing the amount of chemicals that are used on, on uh, 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 grain, whatever is harvested, commodities that are harvested and then stored in the bags. Uh, and then also I sit on the board of a company called Seedlink that is building up the platform to support um, the, the, the development of a real um, seed ecosystem. So when we're, when we're thinking about regenerative agriculture, a critical part is seed. Uh, seeds are very important um, also for building, rebuilding biodiversity into our system. Um, and so they're playing a role to create the platform to actually help um, share information about seeds with both seed companies, uh, farmers, um, and then ultimately consumers around what, which tomatoes taste the best and, and you know, what are the different varieties of kale that are out there? So that's another um, important business. Um, so uh, that's a long-winded answer to say it's, it's been a bit of a windy path, um, but uh, it's been about 10 to 15 years that I've been really interested in sustainability and that's morphed into what we now call regenerative. Um, we have a little more, um, detail around what it is and what we can potentially do. So that's where I am now looking to scale that um, uh, specifically around soil health. Great. Thank you so much, Renee. And thank you so much. I'm already seeing um, there's a question in the chat. Um, please do feel free to just put any other questions. Um, just before going to that question, I just wanted to quickly ask just another general question, because as you said, probably um, not all of us are experts in agriculture. So um, I just wanted to ask a bit um, about regenerative farming just as a concept and about um, essentially how effective and important it can be as a solution to drawing down um, already emitted emissions. Um, yeah, just like a brief overview for anyone who, who isn't aware of what that is. So um, uh, agriculture plays a tremendous role. So I think there's uh, studies that show that agricultural plays, uh, agricultural and grazing play about, uh, uh, are responsible for about 25% of the greenhouse gases that are emitted. Um, so it's a very important sector to, to watch. Um, and then underneath that, 
um, in terms of natural climate solutions, there's a lot of potential with rebuilding soil carbon to be the solution half of that, right? So um, we, uh, various estimates, but um, we think, and I won't share numbers because it's still, but um, there's, we think that there's tremendous potential with um, to mitigate climate change through the rebuilding of soil carbon. So uh, this is really one of those, agriculture is one of those places where we are a serious uh, you know, emitter, but it's also a tremendous opportunity to be part of the solution. Um, so it's a very exciting uh, space. Um, so, and then maybe I'll share just a little bit around regenerative agriculture. Do we think that's Interesting. Okay, so um, this is where I, I um, farms are very unique and geographies are very unique. So it's hard to sometimes say here's like you know the answer for regenerative agriculture, but there are a few practices we know that are very critical for building up soil health. So I'll just share some of those. The impact of which will vary depending on your geography and the current ecosystem in, in which your farm sits, but. Some critical practices that we're focused on is um, increasing air, acres under cover crops. So basically this idea is you never want to have a naked soil. Um, the soil is a living, incredibly rich uh, uh, ecosystem of its own um, and you want to keep continually feed that. So you never want to have a naked soil. So having um, a cover crop is very important. Um, another very important one is uh, minimizing uh, the tillage that happens. So this is, um, again, focused on the soil. You wanna minimize the disturbance. So you don't wanna be coming in there with all kinds of equipment to, to till up the soil. Um, you wanna do that as minimally as possible. And again, it's to preserve that incredible ecosystem that exists in the soil. Um, a third is increasing rotations. Um, I focus quite a bit in the U.S. and uh, we have a, we've really shifted towards a very um, a biculture production. So we have a lot of corn and soybean rotations. Um, and then in other uh, countries and, and, and geographies, it's different. But a very important piece is reintroducing uh, additional rotations. Um, this is important from a farm profitability perspective. So you're kind of uh, diversifying your business but also it's very important for the soil. And again, it's this living ecosystem that needs to be fed different, um, uh, be introduced all kinds of different um, uh, biology to thrive. So increasing rotations is another one. And then the fourth is um, input optimization. So this is uh, you know, one of those tricky ones where I label it one, but it actually means a lot of different things. Um, uh, so it's about optimizing the uh, herbicides and pesticides and nutrients that you're using, fertilizer that you're using on the farm, um, and ensure that you're doing it for with a focus on farm profitability, uh, but also the environmental health and um, um, uh, uh, yields. Um, so uh, those would be kind of the, the four critical practices. Um, but there's and, and that's, those are the four that are focused on soil health, but there's many more that maybe folks have heard about around reintroducing livestock stock to um, uh, uh, farming operations, um, re reintroducing agroforestry to farming operations. Those are also very, very important. Um, but if we're just looking at soil, it's those four that are kind of uh, some of the most critical. Great, thank you so much, Renee. Actually, when you were speaking about um, soil as being like obviously a living being, and it's crazy how sometimes we can kind of forget really the powers of soil and how everything from our food to kind of everything just um, generates from the soil. So it's really important for us to remind ourselves of that. Um, so thank you so much for giving this overview. Now I'm just going to go um, on to the questions from the public because I see some questions in the chat. Um, so do you believe that AG Secretary nominee Vilsack will bring regenerative agriculture to scale in America? Wow, this is a educated audience. Um, <laughs> that's a great question. Thank you to who asked it. Um, I, we, so, so it's early days, um, but there's been some very interesting developments already in terms of the new administration talking about regenerative farming and talking about how to connect the dots between carbon and farming. Um, so that's very interesting because we certainly haven't heard that for the last four years, but also not even be 
before that when um, President Obama was in office. So, um, and uh, we had Secretary Vilsack previously. So he's actually returning to this role. Um, I guess, is this, so that's one. We're, we're starting to hear language, which is very encouraging that we may see real shifts. The other encouraging piece that I think is going to, to drive um, uh, Secretary Vilsack, um, so for everyone that doesn't know, he's going to be the new Secretary of Agriculture coming into the new administration. Um, what we do know about Secretary Vilsack is he has a lot of connections with industry. Um, and we are starting to see, and this is very interesting, that the industry incumbents, so the food companies, but also seed companies and the equipment companies are starting to talk about sustainability and regenerative agriculture. Um, and we think, um, we, we actually, the Nature Conservancy did some early data, and I'll, I'll drop it in the, the chat, a link to this, um, that some of these major food and agribusinesses are starting to look at a, the, the need to focus on regenerative agriculture because it's impacting their supply chain and their businesses. So previously it's always been focused around the sustainability department that was kind of a redheaded stepchild. And now we're starting to see that it's actually being considered core business. And this I think will also have a tremendous influence on Secretary Vilsack's um, uh, focus and like actually uh, implementing true programs that will drive change because the businesses are starting to recognize that it's critical for their for their business growth and long-term success. So two things that are positive, seeing more verbiage around it than we ever have before. And then the pressure I suspect he'll be getting from industry, which we know from his past, past um, uh, presence was um, it, it significantly influenced by industry. So that, that would be my, my answer there. Great, thank you so much, Renee. Um, and thank you for all the questions. Questions. I'm seeing loads of questions. I'm um, kind of just going off um, what you're saying about the financial viability and about uh, the push from businesses. Um, I was um, going to ask a question about, um, so in your opinion, like what is the biggest reason that farmers are not adopting regenerative practices? Like if um, regenerative farming is more financially suitable for them, why are farmers not really um, adop adopting this? Is it the case of like a lack of information and education or do they find like disadvantages to some of these methods? Oh, that is a that is a wonderful question, Agata. If I had the bullseye answer, it'd be wonderful. So one thing I'll say, um, and they touched on a little bit in the video, but um, too often we refer to farmers as as one group, right? It's so interesting because for any other sector, we would we would have more uh, breakdowns and categorization of them as uh, as business owners. So. Um, I would say the reasons things aren't being adopted differ by um, geography, but also size of farm. Um, I'll speak to the US um, and one of the challenges that we have, um, and this is something hopefully Secretary Vilsack that we were just talking about might address, um, the subsidies that are in place. Um, so we have heavy subsidies around insurance, uh, crop insurance, um, and um, uh, uh, indirect subsidies supporting the ethanol market. Um, these are uh, a disincentive to drive change. So one of the, the biggest factors in the US preventing change are disincentives that sit within the US um, uh, farm subsidies. So that's a real challenge for um, US and scaling shifts. Um, another real challenge is um, and this is something the Nature Conservancy has been working on uh, for, for many years, but it's also just lack of information. So for, for most of the time, or, or sorry, I should say for, for decades now, it, really, it used to be universities. And for maybe the last two decades, that's really, it's really shifted towards the input companies that are giving farmers information about how to farm and what, what options exist. And so there just hasn't really been as much of a proliferation of information around how to do it, why to do it. Um, this is starting to change, which is exciting, but it's, um, it's, it's a slow process. Um, and then there's also, um, you know, I, I used to be in equipment. So there's other issues like 
equipment solutions? Like, do we really have the equipment that allows them to scale? So one of the things that I mentioned is minimal till no till farming. Um, do we really have the equipment out in the fields that can support them planting? So actually planting their crops in this minimal till no till uh, system. And a lot of what John Deere has been introducing are these uh, super fast, hyper efficient planters that doesn't that aren't actually um, optimal for a minimal till no till system. So government subsidies are preventing uh, lack of education and then tools. Like, do we have the tools to farm at scale in this manner? And so this is a very much focus on the U.S. There are a lot of other reasons um, in other emerging markets where we're not seeing as much. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why we're not seeing the adoption, um, but we have hope that that's going to change. Yeah, definitely. I would say hope for the future is the best thing um, to do. So um, kind of relating to that and relating to your point about education, um, I wanted to ask you a bit about the importance kind of of um, the portion of the public that's not involved in agriculture professionally or kind of by interest. Um, to be educated and to really get involved with the work being done in this field and um, like if the public can't do anything what's really what's the way that the public um, directly involved can get and push these objectives so as I, I think many here maybe are some of those those folks like the general general public um, uh, one thing, and you you heard about it, right? Like sometimes when I look at, okay, what other industries have already done this shift towards more sustainability? And fashion is an example that we can look at a lot. And how lay consumers who, you know, weren't necessarily part of the fashion ecosystem started voting with their dollars, right? And, and holding companies to task around how things were being produced. And in, in this case, there is a real focus around, um, child labor in the, in the um, uh, uh, factories. Uh, but it was really because consumers, general consumers got educated around what was happening and they started protesting and using their dollars to protest um, around not purchasing uh, um, clothes that they knew were manufactured with, with child labor. So, one thing I would say is educating yourself about where your food is coming from. Um, and I'll put a caveat here. All of those that can educate ourselves around where our food is coming from are sitting in a luxury position. Um, and we actually need to, to really take advantage of that position. It is very important for those of us that can exercise, exercise our uh, vote by using our dollars to buy high quality um, sustainably produced food. Um, and by doing that, we start to create, this is where we're getting into kind of how our current systems work, right? It's economics, it's supply and demand. And so if we could be using our dollars to indicate that there is in fact demand for, we will, we are willing, again, those of us can, that can't afford it are willing to pay for things that um, are produced more sustainably, um, uh, that sends a very important message to food companies globally and um, and and starts to create the demand for a systemic change. Um, so that's critical. The other thing I would say uh, that I don't feel is talked about enough, but it's very important, is for those of us that are lucky enough to have investments, to be looking at where your dollars are invested, um, taking a real hard look about where your um, retirement money sits or, um, you know, other dollars that you have invested and, and thinking about um, uh, leveraging, if you, you have uh, support in that case, but leveraging your power as an investor uh, to pressure companies around um, changing how their supply chains are managed. So there's kind of two ways, I think, um, that very privileged lay folks have an opportunity to, to influence this space. Thank you so much, Renee, for that. Yeah, um, definitely. I'm seeing a lot of questions in the chat. Um, so I definitely yeah. want to focus on those. But just really quickly, because you were talking about kind of using our dollars and using our money um, to be able to support these practices. Um, for example, other like products that are, for example, organic or free range, usually they're more expensive than um, the, the, the usual product. So is this also the case with our products originated from regenerative farming? And if it is, like, how do you think that we can kind of convince the consumer to pay this additional cost? So um, there is, 
as of today, so there's no label. Well, there's um, uh, Patagonia actually has supported the creation of a label called Regenerative Organic. And I, as I understand, actually, there will start to be um, some foods labeled Regenerative Organic. Um, otherwise, there isn't really a label yet. Um, and so in the context of, of, of this audience, or even just in my ecosystem, uh, when I'm thinking about where I could purchase regenerative food, it's at my farmer's market, or it's working with um, actually trying to engage with local farms and, and getting a better understanding of how they're producing their food. Um, and yes, often it is more expensive, um, which is challenging. Um, but what we also want to keep in mind is that um, this idea that you know food is you know just the smallest part of our our income budget um, is challenging. If when we also think about what a critical role it's playing for our health um, and how important it is um, uh, to be able to to kind of look at it as as that that bigger picture. So. Um, it is challenging that it can often be more expensive to eat, you know, what we would consider kind of a, a, um, organic is what, you know, kind of is out there now or free range eggs that you said. Um, but again, there is an opportunity for those of us that can afford to do that, to, to use what we can spend as a signal to the market. Um, and um, um, I, for those who maybe ha had been watching the organic space for a while, the prices from organic have come down. Um, and and this is a, a this is a supply demand action. Um, so um, not an easy answer because there's also a lot of inequalities in the food system, and COVID has certainly highlighted those. Um, but what we do sit in is this capitalist society where it is in fact supply demand forces that drive action by the private you know the the, the companies that are bringing food to the globe. So. Um, it, it's it's unfortunate that maybe that's how it is today, but um, I will circle back to what I had mentioned in the beginning about Secretary Vilsack. Um, the fact that companies are starting to recognize that their supply chains are at risk because their farms are, far, are producing in kind of unsustainable manners means that that could mean that we start to see a more wholesale shift, not driven by um, necessarily higher prices that can be commanded by consumers, but because it's the right thing to do for their business. And that that could be also a very interesting or critical shift. Um, so that was a long, long answer. No, thank you so much. Um, I think it's really valuable to see really how, um, what we're putting out, like how um, we demand and our habits really dictate, um, obviously the, the supply and kind of the shift um, in businesses. So thank you so much for that. Um, I'm just seeing another question here um, about the quality of the soil is strictly connected to the quality of water surrounding it. For instance, in Florida, there is one of the largest freshwater systems in the world called Wakula Springs. For more than 30 years, this water system has been studied. Did you aim your research to this field as well? Um, so absolutely. Soil quality is connected with water quality. And one of the critical pieces around the input optimization piece that I mentioned that's required for building soil health is ensuring that we that we minimize runoff that is significantly impacting uh, water resources. Um, so whoever has asked this question, you're absolutely correct. Um, and it is definitely part of as we as we look at what does it mean to build soil health, it's certainly not, you know, soil isn't in an ecosystem of its own. I mean, this is part of you know, kind of all of this that makes it challenging, but also equally exciting and full of opportunities is that it's all part of this bigger ecosystem. I mean, the planetary ecosystem, but very specifically, you're absolutely right. Soil and water quality are intricately linked. Um, and there is a focus around the, the practices that we're looking to scale to build soil health are also very important for preserving uh, uh, water quality. So, um, it's definitely part of the research um, and, and it's certainly included what, as we thought about what are the critical practices that we're looking to scale to build soil health. Great, thank you so much uh, for answering that, Renee. Um, I can see a lot of other questions, so I'm just gonna move right on. Um, if you had to choose between regenerative livestock agriculture and feeding plants to humans instead of animals, so plant-based foods, um, which one would you choose and why? 
So, um, I think there's probably, so there's probably no way we can make, like to choose for everyone. But what I will say is that there is an important role for livestock, whatever happens to the livestock after it's, it's you know, done its role, but it is, there is a very important role for livestock in agriculture systems. Um, so historically, this has always been the way that food was produced and animals are an intricate part of viable, thriving agriculture ecosystems. Um, so I would say um, uh, another part that that that's kind of this long term vision of, 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 you know, thriving regenerative systems across the globe is the reintroduction of livestock into the system because they play such a critical role in managing for healthy soils um, and um, uh, but in terms of whether someone chooses to eat those animals or they become part of a, of, of a, of a meat system, um, you know, I think that's, that's more for individuals, but there's a, a growing body of research that supports the idea that the animals are absolutely critical for um, highly vibrant, uh, um, uh, productive agriculture ecosystems. Stephanie, thank you so much, Renee, uh, for that. Um, I'm seeing another question here about um, how, um, um, no, what do you think about policies emerging, such as the new vote of the seven year common agricultural policy, which isn't compatible with the Paris Agreement and the 1.5 degree targets? Are we stepping backwards mm. as opposed to stepping forwards? And are you positive for the future, even when things like this happen? So uh, I don't know as much. So I think that's the new EU policy that there are. Is that right, Agatha? Is that what they're discussing? Um, yeah, the Common Agricultural Policy, CAP. Um, uh, but it's not the Green Deal that they're talking about in the EU. Is that right? Um, I don't think so. Uh, yes, EU, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, um, this is hard. This is what we're doing. It's hard. And what you're seeing, so whoever asks this, an excellent point that you know there's been this effort to create this agriculture policy and it's it's at uh, at odds i don't know the details but if it's at odds with the uh, paris climate um accord um i would say that that's it, it, it's painful um but what we're really looking for this kind of systemic shift is very hard and there are so many components to it. Um, but I guess I, I do have hope. So the fact that we can even discuss this, right, that we're even recognizing that there is this agricultural policy that's at odds. Um, and again, this is something that I'm hoping that we're actually going to be started having these conversations at, in the U.S., which is something, you know, we, we haven't talked about it at all. So I am just hopeful that th th this tension and even just this acknowledgement of a tension is brings me hope because it's not even something we would have been discussing 15 years ago. Um, so, and then the other piece I would say is there are so many uh, stakeholders and I think there's still a lot of work to be done to educate um, um, and, and ensure that we're really communicating. This is actually what I appreciate so much about um, Mia and, and the group putting this together is that we actually have to have to do more work of bringing different disciplines together because a, a very important part of that ag policy and the, the, the lack of coordination with the Paris Climate Accord is just um, educating and an and understanding from all the parties that are sitting in, in, in both camps um, and, and learning how to speak a common language um and listening um so that's kind of a i kind of went off there but um i do have hope because we're just even having this conversation and, and there's tension to be talked about um and then i i do really think that there's work to be done and i think that the artist community has a critical role to play um we just saw that beautiful video um you know how can we be using different tools to communicate the message across the different stakeholders and, and again, start speaking a common language and going after um, a common goal 
um, that's really still being defined and, and, and understood. Um, so that's a long-winded answer to say I do still have hope. 